The Story of Edward the Seventh, Part One. The Victorians were extremely snobby and very well-to-do people in public. They were repressed beyond belief due to the stigmas of society, but the lives they led in private couldn't have been any different to the cells that they showed to the public. Victorian England was widespread with alcohol, debauchery and scandal. The scandals were their form of entertainment and so they spread like wildfire. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. As the heir to the throne and Prince of England, the life of Queen Victoria's infamous son, King Edward VII, was top of the public's entertainment and he gave them plenty to talk about. His bedroom antics was one of the most talked about gossip for centuries and his mother was completely embarrassed by him. He was nicknamed Dirty Bertie by the public and knew how to be a royal with style. As well as his public nickname, his family also had a cute one for him. The future King Edward VII was born on the 9th of November 1841 in Buckingham Palace. His parents called him Albert Edward, but they also nicknamed him Bertie. Bertie was the second eldest child, but due to being born a boy, he was the heir to the throne of England from the moment he was born. His parents laid down the law, but they couldn't contain him no matter what they tried. Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, wanted to educate their son so that he would become the best king that he could. Albert, in particular, took a special interest in young Edward's education, as he did with all of his children. But this would lead to the first of many disappointments for his parents, because he was not interested in his studies at all. Some of his other siblings excelled in their studies, but Edward was not one of them, despite his desire to impress his parents. His tutors were impressed with his charm, however, despite his abilities and educations being lacking. His charm would be something he actually used throughout his life, unlike his studies. His parents were not keen on his ability to charm. They were just interested in his ability to be a good heir, which only led to that disappointment. He was a crowd pleaser and at 19 years old and wherever he visited the public, showed up in their thousands to greet him. He took an official tour of North America as the Prince of Wales, where he laid the cornerstone of Canada's Parliament Hill. He then watched a tightrope walk across Niagara Falls, and he stayed with President James Buckingham in the White House. Edward was used to being surrounded by his overbearing parents and siblings, who were also under the thumb. But this trip truly opened him up to a new way of life, and he enjoyed it. Edward returned from his diplomatic trip with a completely new mindset. Edward had become withdrawn and reserved, perhaps due to the pressure to perform and constant failure in his parents' eyes. However, this trip to North America opened up his eyes, and he gained a lot of confidence in himself. He returned from his trip a confident man with charisma. With this newfound confidence, it pushed him into his next venture and greatest love, and that was women. He was at an age now where it was expected for him to marry. His parents sent him to Germany in 1861 in the guise that he would be watching military manoeuvres. His parents had an obvious ulterior motive. They were keen on their nearly 20-year-old son finding a wife. When Edward arrived in Germany, he met the girl his parents were keen for him to marry, further proving this trip was for matchmaking and nothing more. Princess Alexandra of Denmark, or Alex, was the family's choice for him, and luckily the two of them hit it off. It didn't take long for the families to arrange their marriage, but there was just one problem. 
Bertie was already romancing other ladies. Poor Alex had no idea she was about to marry a serial womaniser. Not long before travelling to Germany, Edward had been away to Ireland so that he could gain some army experience. He was expected to stay in the barracks with other men to get the full experience, but this came with the camaraderie of his colleagues when they encouraged him to meet the ladies. This is where Edward met the actress Nellie Clifton, who would become the first lady in a long, long line of mistresses. Nellie had stolen the heir's heart. The pair already knew each other from a party that they both attended in England, and she happened to be staying in Ireland at the same time as him, while Edward was out of his parents' prying eyes. They say you join the army a boy and you leave a man. Well, that was certainly the case for Edward, but probably not for the reason most people would think. Edward's fellow cadets in Ireland were encouraging of the prince's rebellious encounters and they even allowed the actress to hide in their barracks for three days while she and Edward had their fun. It was during these three days that Edward lost his virginity, not long before he met Princess Alexandra, and it seems he got a thing for it. The young prince was only 19 years old, and he was just starting to live his life to the full, much to the distress of his parents. The Victorians loved a bit of gossip, especially if it involved one of the royals, and his affair became common knowledge to his parents, who were absolutely horrified. Particularly his father, who decided to make the trip to Ireland, specifically to talk some sense into the boy. Little did they both know this trip would be the beginning of the end. Prince Albert already struggled with ill health most of his life and he was particularly vulnerable to the elements. During his trip to see his son, the pair took a walk in the rain together where Albert attempted to chastise his son. But his words fell on deaf ears and Bertie refused to curb his behaviour. Albert passed away just two short weeks after his talk with his son and the coincidence of the trip and his death sparked a hatred in his mother. Victoria was beside herself with grief and she wore mourning clothes for the rest of her life. The pain she felt towards her husband's death was reflected on her son through anger. She had always been disappointed in Bertie and this turn of events only worsened it because she blamed him for his father's death. Queen Victoria had never been affectionate with Bertie, but this was typically because she believed he was a disaster. When Prince Albert passed, Victoria allegedly absolutely blamed her son. While she once found him embarrassing, she now despised him. She even wrote to her eldest daughter, I can or shall look at him without a shudder. Edward was already a disappointment to his parents and now his mother despised him. So he decided, rather than try to be the better person and make amends with my mother, that he would continue to live his life however he pleased. However, he did oblige at getting married, as his father had wished before his death and he did go on to marry the girl his parents had chosen for him. At the age of 21, he married the 18-year-old Alexandra of Denmark at Windsor Castle on the 10th of March, 1863. His wedding vows were more like guidelines than actual rules, and there was no wedding ring on earth that was going to keep Edward tied to just one woman. Even his father's wishes to stop his affair with Nellie did not curb it as he continued to see her despite his father telling him to break it off. When Edward returned to England he started his affair right back up again but it didn't last long as he had eyes on even more women. Edward was becoming a womaniser and his wife had to accept that he would never be monogamous. She knew he was sleeping around with mistresses, but she just had to ignore it. 
if she wished to be his queen consort and wife. It is believed he had at least 55 mistresses, and those are the ones that we know about. It was due to this behaviour that got him the nickname Dirty Bertie, which is not the best name to be associated with the future King of England. Bertie was unfazed by the nickname. He continued to womanise his way through society with his 55 mistresses, as well as the prostitutes he saw in Paris brothels also. Yet for all his debauchery, Edward was remarkably discreet, and more often than not, the society gossips could only guess at who was sharing the prince's bed on a given night. But the thing about affairs is, if you have enough of them, you start to leave behind a pretty obvious evidence. Edward had countless affairs, and he never acknowledged a single illegitimate child. He was either the most careful man alive, or he was lying about the consequences of his behaviour. Part 2 of Edward VII Edward was facing a crisis when in 1864, Lady Susan Vane Tempest, husband, died. She was full of grief and she turned to Edward's arms. After a few years of dating, one of Susan's closest friends wrote to him in 1871, stating that the crisis was due within two or three months. This was not a very well underwrapped secret of the pair, and this is one of many credible sources of Edward's secret love children, whom he never acknowledged. Sadly, this particular story had a tragic ending. This pregnancy and the consequential child were kept a secret by Susan until the very end. She gave birth in 1871, but the fate of this child is unknown. It is unknown whether she was forced to keep the secret or that she chose to. But when she passed in 1875, at only 36 years old, she had kept it all to herself. Lady Susan and her child were just a sad footnote on the long list of Edward's conquests. But while Edward's affair with the Lady Vane Tempest ended tragically, it stayed almost entirely out of the papers. But we can't say that about his next affair. His many affairs got him into hot water on many occasions, and he was then caught up in a divorce scandal. His mother's view on him was not improved by the scandal of 1869, whereby Sir Charles Mordaunt, a member of Parliament, planned to divorce his wife. Divorcing your wife is nothing special, but this differed because this begrudged man was sick of his wife's antics, and he was willing to name Bertie in his divorce suit as a contributing factor, putting the blame on the future King of England. His affair left evidence behind in the form of steamy letters that he had written and Sir Charles had discovered these for the ultimate showdown. He went snooping on his wife's private writing desk and he found many pages of letters from the Prince of Wales. Edward had mostly managed to keep his affairs private, but for some reason he couldn't resist writing love letters to his mistresses. The letters were not foolproof of their affair, despite being very saucy and damning. What he discovered next was all the proof he needed, because the mistress's husband caught him in their house. He came home early one day, only to discover the pair together alone in the house. Although they were not caught in the act, as it would have been suggested by the Victorian gossip, which had over-exaggerated the situation, Finding a man and a woman alone together was about as scandalous as it gets, and so their guilt was sealed. Her husband was rightly absolutely fuming, which is to be expected upon realising that your wife is having an affair with a powerful heir of the UK. Most people would say his reaction went too far as his rage turned dark. After he found his wife in a clink with the Prince of Wales, he ordered him home in anger, but rather than take the time to call off, he escalated his anger 
when he took his wife into the garden and shot two white ponies in front of her. Despite keeping his affairs on the down low normally, he could not avoid it with this one. The prince's reputation took a tumble, and despite Edward not being named as a co-respondent in his divorce, he was already proven to be the cause of the marriage breakdown. Edward had taken a battering to his reputation, but it was nothing compared to the consequences that his mistress faced at the end of the affair, and her fate was much darker. As a woman put on trial, they did not face a fair trial. The defence argued hysteria from her part, and her own lawyers claimed insanity as a defence for her adultery. To admit to insanity, her life was destroyed forever. Her ex-husband, as the man, could continue his life travelling around Europe and sleeping with as many women as he desired, while she was kept in hiding for the rest of her life, hidden from sight in a series of private cottages. She was eventually sent to live out her final days in a lunatic asylum, where she passed away in secrecy. Many of the women tangled went on to meet sad fates, and in 1871, Edward himself nearly did too, when he was caught up in danger. Despite being caught up in many scandals, the public loved him, perhaps due to his relatability, or because he provided many an entertaining story. The scandals were piling high, and with charisma and popularity, and after his brush with the same dangerous illness as his father was rumoured to die from, they only loved him more. In 1871, Edward caught typhoid fever. He was able to cling to life, unlike some of the guests that he was staying with, while the country waited with anticipation. He was one of the lucky ones, and he survived the typhoid fever, and people of England rejoiced all over the country. He may have been a handful, but he was still beloved by the public. The country didn't need another tragedy, and losing him so young. The public believed he was a kind soul, despite his scandals, because he always treated everybody with respect, no matter their class or colour. Some of his letters revealed that he was disgusted by the racism in India, on a trip that he took. He remarked, because a man has a black face and a different religion from our own, there was no reason why he should be treated as a brute. Back then, racism was rife and so his remarks were completely against the grain and he was well ahead of others of his class. It's easy to write Edward off as a ladies' man, but there was actually a lot more to him than met the eye because he accepted everybody. The man had many affairs and he was an avid gambler, but due to the anti-Semitism at the time, the public believed that he had crossed the line when he started fraternising with the Jewish Rothschild family. As a Prince of Wales, though he was not phased by others' opinions, and he would do what he felt was right, when he felt it was right. Ahead of his time in more ways than one, he was also a fashion icon in his own right, because he always knew how to dress the part. Edward shaped men's fashion all across Europe, and it didn't take long for men all over the continent to begin imitating his style. He wore tweed suits, Homburg hats or Norfolk jackets, as well as inspiring the black tie events that we have today. The standard dress for men at evening events was white ties and tails, but Edward again went against the grain and began to wear a simple black tie. The tradition has stuck to this day, and that's not even Edward's biggest contribution to the world of men's fashion. Edward was a large man, and so he could not, or he refused to do the button of his waistcoat or suit, jack it up. This tradition is still continued to be practised today by men all over the world. Edward was the ultimate womaniser, and so his appearance was important to him, and he had a lot of married women to chase. If you thought we were done with Edward's affairs, you're sorely mistaken. We're just getting started. You would have thought Edward would have learnt from his previous affair, and despite keeping his antics out of the papers for a few years 
after the Mordaunt scandal. He was starting to cause a stir once again. He was attending the theatre when a young actress caught his eye in 1877. Her name was Lily Langtry and he started his chase to get her. She was also married but Edward was unfazed by this fact. What followed would prove to be one of the most intense affairs of Edward's life and her husband never became a problem as it did before. Edward was able to pull all of the right strings and he managed to get his seat right next to Lantry at the dinner party they, they both attended. It was custom for the host to seat her husband at the complete opposite end of the table. The pair hit it off immediately and she could not resist his charm and it didn't take long before they ended up in bed together. The couple became the new gossip in Victorian London. The Queen's son caught up in a scandalous affair with a married famous actress. The affair continued for three years but came to an abrupt end when she ended up getting pregnant. He ended the sexual relationship between the pair but they did continue to have a strong friendship for years to come. Historians believe that he was not the father and that she had also been playing the field with many other men at the same time. Despite the romantic end to their affair, Edward did continue to support Lily financially for years. Most people who knew of Edward knew he was a decent and kind man, but his mother did not agree and she was hugely disappointed in him. As the heir to the throne, he should have been busy. His schedule should have been full to the brim. But his mother pushed him out. She didn't want him to have any part of the formal royal role that he was deserving of and so he used his spare time to womanise women instead. Victoria thought her son was a complete and abject failure, and she didn't trust him to take part in any matters of state. He was only involved in very few public appearances, and so he used his time to get involved in many interesting things. One of his dubious hobbies was to party in Paris, and throughout the 1880s, and 90s. Edward didn't spend that much time in England. Perhaps this was due to his mother who struggled to even look at him. Edward wanted an escape and he found it in the Parisian underworld where he soon became something of a legend. Join me to discover how his life in Paris panned out and if you thought Edward's English affairs were crazy just wait till you hear what he got up to. In the city of love. Edward likely frequented every single one of the high-class cat houses in Paris, but his preference and most frequented was by far the infamous Le Chabonnet. He stayed so regularly he actually had his own room, complete with his coat of arms over the bed and an elaborate copper bathtub with a massive half-woman, half-swan figurehead. Years later, Salvador Dali bought the bathtub for 112,000 francs. Le Chabonnet speedily became a home away from home for the prince, and let's just say he got very relaxed there. Thanks to Edward VII, Le Chabonnet included one of the most infamous pieces of furniture in history, the love chair. Made from only the best quality wood and upholstery, Edward's love seat looked strange. It looked uncomfortable to sit in, but that's because it wasn't designed for sitting. It was designed for his late night antics. Women were Edward's favourite hobby, but he had a lot more to go around. Second on the list was perhaps his love for food, and by the 1880s, Edward had grown his waistline in line with his appetite. His ginormous stomach had begun to intrude on his bedroom antics, so he had a famous cabinet maker, Louis Soubria, design and make the love chair to enable him to continue to appreciate the fruits of the working girls, sometimes several at once, despite his considerable girth. Edward enjoyed a good time more than just about anyone in England, and he didn't limit his luxuries to just women. 
The prince adored his food as well and reportedly ate five whole meals a day. Most of them gluttonous, ten-course extravaganzas. And of course, he needed copious amounts of boudet and champagne to wash it all down with. By the time he finally became king, Edward's waistline had ballooned to 48 inches. No wonder he needed that special chair. Although publicly the Victorians were viewed as being prim, proper and suppressed people, behind closed doors they were debauched, full of affairs, gambling and drinking. Edward's debauchery had only just begun, and there's another crazy story about him. If you attended the Parisian nightlife in the 1880s and 90s, there was a high possibility that you would bump into Edward sooner or later. While he loved Le Chabonnet and his love chair, he knew that variety was the spice of life. He also loved the city's nightclubs, particularly the renowned Moulin Rouge, where he would regularly be seen with a new French socialite or actress on his arm every week. Compared to the grim and depressing London, where the shadow of his mother and her perpetual mourning hung over him, it's not surprising that Edward spent so much of his time in Paris. Despite all of his naughty antics in Paris, he did have a very large family to look after back home, and he still managed to juggle his family life with his naughty chairs and burlesque shows. It is shocking that while he was living his best life, living as an eligible bachelor, that he was in fact married with a family. He had a whole brood of kids back in England, and evidently his constant affairs didn't keep Edward from his marital duties. Notwithstanding his infidelity, Edward and his wife Alex had six children together, starting with the eldest, Prince Albert Victor. What can we say, Victorians are weird, by all accounts Princess Alexandra was supposedly fine with her husband's womanising. But then, what choice did she have? She is said to have welcomed several of the mistresses into their home and even acknowledged them in public. While it's entirely possible she buried her resentment deep down, these are Victorians that we're talking about. After all, every account seems to show that Alec was totally fine with it. Edward sounds arduous to live with and to be with romantically. Maybe it was just easier for her to accept than resist. They are reported to have remained friends even while Edward was womanising his way through Paris but their lives were not absent of tragedy. Edward and Alexandra had six children. Their sixth and final child, Prince Alexander, John, passed away just a day after he was born. This left the couple devastated and they would not go on to have any more children. Agreeing to reports of that sad day, Edward individually laid their boy in his tiny casket with tears rolling down his cheeks. This tragic loss of a child would not be the only loss they would experience, and it wasn't long until they were having to bury yet another one of their children. Not even Edward could keep up his playboy antics forever. Perhaps his age caught up to him, but in 1890, Edward confessed to his son, George, that he was finally getting too old for these amusements. That did not mean that he gave up all of his debauched behaviour and he maintained relationships with various mistresses until the day that he passed away. He just slowed down a little. However, he clearly had an addictive personality and the absence of hundreds of women in his life just left for more time for other bad habits. Another bad habit that he enjoyed was gambling. It was Edward's style to get tangled up in yet another scandal, and this was no different. Despite his numerous trips to Paris, Edward had in some way survived a few years without a major public scandal, 
but all of that was about to change. In 1890, he attended boys' night with other high-flying members of society at the home of one Arthur Wilson for some friendly high-stake baccarat. There were just two problems. First of all, the game was absolutely illegal. And secondly, Wilson caught one of Edward's friends, Sir William Corden Cumming, cheating. Although this friendly night seems like a small-time offence, this incident reflected very badly on Edward, and it didn't just blow over like you would expect. It would unravel to be one of the biggest scandals to rock the royal family in years, when he had to attend court. Gordon Cumming, like a lot of people who were caught cheating, went into defensive mode. He angrily exploded on his accusers and demanded a retraction of their accusations. Tempers were heightened and the debacle ended up in court. This was bad enough for Edward because everybody knew that he was there that night, but it was about to get a whole heap worse. The scandal was intensified for Edward because he was called as a witness to testify. This was the first time any English court had called an heir to their throne to stand trial in over 400 years. Due to his association with this man, Gordon Cumming, that the court found guilty of cheating, his reputation took a massive hit. The Victorians were extremely judgy and would cancel anybody who went against the status quo. In retaliation to the man's actions, he was kicked out of the army and completely ostracised him from public society. The public were angry at the prince, but being the best charmer of England, the people weren't going to stay mad at him for long. Edward had caused his parents a lot of pain with his rebellious behaviour, and unfortunately for Edward, he had created his own problem child too. His eldest son, Prince Albert Victor, was next in line to the throne after Edward. It appears that the young prince took after his father because when Albert Victor grew into a young man, rumours began to spread about him too and he became the new form of gossip for the people. He became nearly as scandalous as Edward with rumours spreading about his wild affairs, rumours that he was a male prostitute as well as strange rumours that he was secretly Jack the Ripper. But then, tragedy struck. Prince Albert Victor, at a very young age of only 27, when in the prime of his life, the influenza pandemic of 1889 ravaged England. Pandemics do not discriminate against one class, and senior and poor classes alike suffered. The strapping young prince fell victim to the disease before passing from pneumonia on the 14th of January 1892. And Edward's heartbreaking letters reveal just how devastated he was. Though the relationship between Edward and Queen Victoria had always been strained, the loss of Albert Victor at least brought them closer together for a time. In the following days after Albert's passing, Edward surprisingly wrote to his mother, To lose our eldest son is one of those calamities one can never get over. I would have given my life for him, as I put no value on mine. It took a few years for Edward to get back on his womanising wagon that he was accustomed to. He met Alex Keppel, a woman 26 years his senior. Even at 56 years old, Edward was still the same old dirty rascal and Keppel rapidly became his new mistress. There was something special about Alice Keppel. She was different to his usual mistresses and they had an arrangement. Keppel had at least one thing going for her in Edward's eyes. She was married and this was evidently something that the prince enjoyed. He started visiting her at her home at 30 Portsman Square. Her husband would make himself scarce for these royal visits. Her husband perhaps knew that he could benefit financially from having informant with the heir. 
Edward was inclined to treat the women who shared his bed exceptionally well, sometimes even after their affairs ended. He couldn't just flat out give Alex Keppel money for the privy purse, but instead Edward gave her shares in a rubber company. She earned a cool 50,000 out of the deal, which is about seven and a half million pounds today. Even her poor husband got something out of the arrangement when Edward found him a new job with a better salary. Eating five different ten-course meals a day can't be healthy, but neither is smoking 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars daily, but that didn't stop Edward. Edward truly lived the motto, we're here for a good time, not a long time. But despite his plumpness and smoking like a chimney, Edward clearly never had trouble finding the ladies. No, the trouble came after he found them. And the scandals did not stop coming. He went on to start dating Lady Randolph Churchill, which is Winston Churchill's mother. When he crossed paths with Winston Churchill's mum, she was used to being embroiled in her own scandals. She was known as Jenny to her friends, and those that enjoyed Edward's gossip on his affairs also gossiped about the many or equal stories about Jenny also. It was only a matter of time before the two of them crossed paths. As his usual type would suggest, Jenny was a married woman, but you and I both know that didn't really matter much. As if history was repeating itself and that he had not learnt from his mistakes of the past, Edward began to write her secret steamy letters. This was the evidence to back up their private meetings which just as Sir Charles Mordaunt caught his wife with the Prince of Wales, so did Lord Randolph. Their friendship and romantic connection was shown through their nicknames. Edward called Jenny Machair and she affectionately called him Tum Tum in these letters. With the Victorians you have to read between the lines. While a lot of them were freaks in the sheets, Edward especially, they would never be so daring as to be obvious in writing. That's why Edward's letters to Lady Randolph Churchill may perhaps not appear so ridiculous. He would occasionally ask to go and see her for Japanese tea and entertainments, which doesn't sound too weird until you understand what Japanese tea actually meant to the pair. Edward wasn't talking about green tea. For the romantic pair, Japanese tea meant that she would serve him tea wearing nothing but a loose-fitting kimono. Aside from Queen Victoria, nearly everybody else in England seemed to love Edward, but a further scandal may have transformed that. This one involved him being embroiled in another love triangle. Daisy Greville became another of Edward's mistresses, but when she and the prince grew apart, she cosied up to his friend, Lord Charles Beresford. As affairs often do, the affair turned sour between the two and Edward took it upon himself to get involved in their feud, siding with Daisy over his previous friend. This left Beresford infuriated and the feud shattered their once close relationship. This resulted in the charming prince making his very first enemy. Edward's life was, was largely affairs and scandals but it wasn't wholly just affairs and scandals. He was also faced with his own assassination attempt when in 1900s a 15-year-old boy shot at him in the train station. The attempt went wrong and the young boy missed every shot at the prince and when the case went to court, a jury ended up acquitting him because he was under age and he had also caused no damage. Edward dealt with the whole palaver very quickly and he remained unfazed by the whole situation. But then, less than a year later, Edward's life changed forever when he became king. 
Dirty Bertie was the Prince of Wales for seemingly a never-ending time. Queen Victoria had reigned for many, many years, but despite shocking her family members, she couldn't live forever. And on the 22nd of January 1901, she passed at 81 years old. Edward was 60 years old at this point when he finally became King Edward VII, King of the United Kingdom and Emperor of India. Victoria had feared the day that Edward would and could get close to the throne, so she kept him at arm's length. Although over the years their relationship did somewhat soften over the decades, she never quite got around to believing in her son. She believed he would make a terrible king, but Edward was full of surprises. In pure Dirty Bertie style, he invited his mistresses to his coronation, and some of them even took a front seat. He even organised a specific pew for the king's special ladies. Not even becoming the King of England could change his ways, he just moved on to newer nicknames. Dirty Bertie's nickname was changed to King Edward the Caresser, a play on King Edward the Confessor, and he continued to live his life however he pleased, just with more power this time. Edward had always been popular despite his mother being cautious of him getting close to the crown. All of the scandals in the world could not stop the public from loving him. He was one of the most popular men in England. The nation were absolutely ecstatic when he became king. He has even been called the most popular king England had known since the earlier 1660s. The disappointing son of Victorian Albert became a man and a king that they should have been proud of. Alongside his naughty nicknames that reflected his scandals and mistresses, he was also known as the Uncle of Europe. This was because he was related to nearly every single monarch on the continent due to the many matchmaking couples that his mother had made. Victoria had held a gloomy and mourning vibe over the public for years and the people felt suppressed. But with Edward as king, the public could breathe a sigh of relief. However, due to his poor health choices, his reign unfortunately did not last long. Queen Victoria reigned for 63 years and Edward didn't even make it to 10. By 1909, his health started to decline on one occasion, he even fainted during a state visit to Berlin. He made a recovery from his fall, but this marked the beginning of the end. It was only a year later that he once again collapsed during a visit to France. His condition had worsened and it was much more serious. His poor health came at the worst time for politics as the government was in crisis and needed their monarch to be strong. England had elected a liberal government, but the tenaciously conservative House of Lords refused to pass their budget. Edward needed to give his full attention, but he was just too poorly to travel back to England. His illness was kept a secret by his attendants, so everybody in England assumed he was just off gallivanting in France like the old days. Edward was nearly 70 years old and his lifestyle had finally caught up to him. His health continued to decline further and further and although his mother doubted his ability to be king, Edward took his role very seriously and he wanted to work until the very end. However, on the 6th of May 1910, he suffered several heart attacks. His doctors tried to urge him to his bed, but he refused, saying, No, I shall not give in. I shall go on. I shall work to the end. And he did just that, because while he didn't realise it, the end was near. It wasn't long, and Edward was very weak and he struggled to stand. In a heartbreaking moment, his son George, the future King George V, tried to improve his father's spirits. 
George spoke with him about how his horse had won at Kempton Park earlier that afternoon, and Edward faintly replied, Yes, I have heard of it. I am very glad. Those were the last words he'd ever say. Dirty Bertie, Edward the Caresser, King Edward the Seventh, passed on that night at half eleven, at sixty-eight years old. Without Edward, his wife finally had control, and she took over when her husband passed away. She was in charge of who could visit Edward and when, and she refused to allow anyone to move him for days afterwards. Many of Edward's mistresses wanted to say goodbye, and while some of them did it with respect, Alice Keppel was not one to follow the rules. Upon hearing the news that the king had passed, she romantically dropped everything and she ran to Buckingham Palace. With little tact for his mourning wife, she arrived demanding entry, waving a letter from the king, from himself in her hands. The guards gave in and allowed Keppel inside, though I'm sure they would soon regret that decision. Alexandra had bit her tongue and held her cool for many years, but Keppel's behaviour had broken her patience until she finally muttered, Get that woman away, and her guards took Keppel outside. Finally, on May the 11th, she allowed her attendants to dress Edward in his uniform and place him in a massive custom made coffin. Three days later, she finally moved his body to the throne room to lay in state. Alexandra noted that Edward's body, now eight days cold, was still wonderfully preserved. He laid in state for several days before Alexandra had attendants place Edward's remains on a carriage and they began the long, sad walk to Westminster Hall along with the rest of his family. Even Edward's beloved dog, an adorable wire fox terrier named Caesar, trotted along beside them. The family remained for a short service before they made a swift exit, so that the public could mourn over their late king. The hall was open to the public and is one of the most popular kings in England history. Mourning crowds arrived in droves to pay their respects. Before Edward's burial, over 400,000 people filed past his coffin in just two days. The scandalous prince turned beloved king was gone and the people wanted to say goodbye. As the uncle of Europe with family members all across Europe, every monarch on the continent made their trip to pay their respects. It has been described as one of the greatest assemblage of royalty and rank ever gathered in one place, and, of its kind, the last. It would only be a short few years later that World War I would tear Europe apart, where kingdoms fell, alliances broke, and Europe was never the same again. Of all of Queen Victoria and Albert's children, Several historians believe that her youngest son, Prince Leopold, was the cleverest and the most interesting of all of the young royals. His short life was full of intrigue, drama and a danger that was at the very heart of the British monarchy, despite him never being able to see the British throne. The eighth child and second youngest heir of the reign in Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, little Leopold came into the world as something of a medical marvel. Queen Victoria had given birth eight times and she controversially used chloroform as a form of pain relief, which went against the status quo of the public at the time. It was a Christian belief at the time that women were supposed to suffer in childbirth and if they interrupted this natural way of things, there might be divine consequences. Leopold came into the world happy and seemingly healthy, and the palace was full of relief. However, this relief did not last very long, as his health took a decline over the years. 
Victorian concepts of parenting are a lot different than our own today, but the royal household of Queen Victoria was bizarre by any standards. Victoria had outwardly reported how much she despised being both childbearing and large parts of child rearing, despite having a large brood of nine children running around. As the eighth child, Leopold was often forgotten and the impact of his birth on his mother may have led her to suffer from postpartum depression. And Leopold's father, Albert, wrote in a letter not long afterwards about Victoria's continuance of hysterics. Victoria played her children off against each other and one way to do this was to put forward her favourite child over the others. Her alleged favourite was Prince Arthur, who she told her husband, Prince Albert, that out of all of her children, Arthur was dearer than any of the others put together. Leopold was always known to be a sickly boy, just like his father. He suffered greatly with anxiety, which led to a number of physical problems, such as indigestion, and no matter how much the palace fed him, he remained rail thin and weak. When he was a growing toddler, he started moving around and he would bruise very easily and suffer major injuries at the smallest of falls. It wasn't long before Victoria and Albert searched for answers and came to a disturbing conclusion that his illness was a fatal one. A dark secret clouded the royal family whereby the males born to the many match-made couples that descended from Queen Victoria would suffer from a genetic disease called haemophilia, which prevents blood from clotting properly. Victoria had passed this on to her son, and suddenly, the prince's dangerous falls and sickly disposition made all too much sense. Unfortunately for little Prince Leopold, the dangerous impacts of haemophilia manifest in men and not women and it was soon very clear that the princeling was in fatal danger at all moments of the day. Victoria did worry constantly about his internal bleeding, and nobody believed that he would survive into adulthood. As well as this condition passed from his mother, medical professionals also believed that the prince was suffering from another illness. Leopold would suffer from fits, which led them to believe he had epilepsy, which at the time was a sign that he was cursed or bewitched. The family did not deal with his depositions very well, with his mother taking full control over his life. Queen Victoria was very protective of her son, and she kept him practically under lock and key, and from the moment he could crawl, he had a whole team of doctors constantly checking up on him and making sure that the royal didn't have a hair out of place. Leopold was only eight years old when his father died in 1861. Albert was only 42 when the Grim Reaper came knocking and his passing through Queen Victoria into a notorious state of mourning. Prince Leopold had not only inherited his sickly disease from his mother, but he had also inherited her looks. His wide, heavy-lidded eyes, the set of his small mouth, and his oval face as well as Victoria's light hair. As a male member of the monarchy, it was tradition for the princes to form part of the military, but due to his condition, his mother banned him from all military service, excepting some honorary positions that were merely symbolic. All of his brothers went on to have some form of military service, which must have been bittersweet for him to witness, and a massive downer to his ego, and something that likely humiliated the young Victorian man. So something had to give. Leopold could not be physical in any way, and so he turned his attention to his mental capabilities. The prince had the best tutors royalty could buy, but no less than the poet Laurette Alfred, Lord Tennyson noted the boy's quick mind and immense capacity for learning. Despite being academically bright, this did not rid him of his rebellious nature, 
As a teenager, he began to grow tired of his mother's watchful and overbearing eye, and so he became a college boy. He had to beg and plead with Queen Victoria to let him attend the University of Oxford out in the world. Victoria finally relented when he was 19, and Leopold got a tiny taste of what independence felt like. Still feeling constrained by his mother's watchful eye, Leopold went to drastic measures to win his full freedom. He made the decision that getting married was his only hope of getting out, and he started his quest for a wife by looking around Europe for a royal bride. As a Prince of England, Leopold should obviously have no trouble at finding a wife, right? His secret illness was no longer a secret, which meant that unfortunately for Leopold, he wasn't exactly the most eligible bachelor. As a result, he went through a painful number of options, including the heiress Daisy Maynard and Princess Frederica of Hanover, but all of them rejected him for one reason or another. Then his meddling mother got involved in the matchmaking process and set him up on a blind date. She was actually extremely good at her matchmaking and after watching him fail over and over again, she soon suggested that Leopold meet up with Princess Helena, the daughter of a German prince and one of Leopold's distant cousins. The German princess had a bad reputation in England for being frigid and distant, but the truth couldn't have been further from this gossip. She was the exact opposite. She loved being among the people. Helena was also very beautiful, and therefore she was absolutely perfect for Leopold. Princess Helena was, was unusually and shockingly educated for a woman of her time, she could compete with her match on an intellectual level. She loved math and philosophy and Leopold was impressed with her. He was completely delighted with her and he even introduced Helena to his academic circle of friends from Oxford. Obviously, Helena impressed them mightily because she continued lifelong friendships with the group. Leopold had a lovely, extravagant royal wedding, as you would expect for a prince of England. He didn't wait around and he jumped right into matrimony with Helena, marrying her on the April 27th, 1882. He was 29 years old and she was eight years his junior at just 21. The wedding was a royal fairy tale. Helena's train was a full six yards long and embroidered in silver. The service was performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. As a nervous groom and as one who was not used to the giant public displays of affection and publicity, Helena was clear and confident with her vows, but this cannot be said for Leopold. He mumbled his way through the service with not so distinctly audible answers. Unlike many of the arranged marriages of the past, especially in the royal family, Leopold did well to find true love with Helena. It has been reported that their marriage was blissful, with the married pair complimenting each other well. Leopold was just happy to have gained his independence from his mother finally. They went on to produce children, and only a year later, his wife gave birth to his first child, Princess Alice, in 1883. Leopold was living with a curse, and he would pass his disease on to his daughter. As a female, she would not see the impact of haemophilia, but she would go on to become a royal carrier. Determined to grow their family, only a year later, the pair would go on to become pregnant again in 1884. They were in the prime of their lives. They were enjoying family time together with their daughter and their baby on the way. They envisioned a long, bright future together, 
raising little royals for Grandma Victoria. But unfortunately, Leopold's body had a different plan in store for him when it began to fail him. Leopold was approaching 30, but his royal blood disease was beginning to cause him joint pains during the cold and wintry English winters. His doctors urged him to seek better climates abroad away from his pregnant wife in Cairns, but this would be his ultimate undoing. Leopold was part of a large brood and he particularly was close to Princess Louise, who was Queen Victoria's sixth child and only five years older than Leopold. Louise was the rebel of the family and when Leopold was still a child, she set him a particularly bad example when he was caught up in one of her scandals. It is rumoured that Princess Louise began an affair with Leopold's tutor Walter Sterling before falling in love and creating a secret love child that would be brought up by a non-royal family, but this was never proven. Leopold was only 14 years old at the time, but he already knew which side he was on. Leopold did not portray a rebellious boy, but he was a geeky guy with a cheeky side. When Queen Victoria dismissed Walter Sterling from royal service, Leopold still kept up a secret correspondence with the man. Despite living a marriage of bliss, it has been alleged that Leopold may have been set to marry another woman called Alice Liddell. She was the real life inspiration for Alice's adventures in Wonderland, with some even suggesting that he named his daughter Alice after her. But others allege that he was not in love with Alice, but instead he was in love with her younger sister Edith, who was closer to his age. Alice served as a secret smokescreen for Leopold's undying devotion to Edith. If he was so in love with Edith, why did he not go on to marry her? The answer is a heartbreaking one. In 1876, when Leopold was failing in his quest for a bride, the young little girl died from measles or periontonitis, which is inflammation of the abdomen. Leopold played his part in her funeral with a touching display of affection when he helped carry her coffin into the funeral procession. Queen Victoria lived in fear that her precious boy would be suddenly taken from her and so she was overbearing and protected of him and his health. But as the years went on, she enjoyed the control she had over him and the fact that he relied on her so heavily. He was kept at her side, just how she liked it, before giving him a promotion to handle her affairs. When Leopold was a young adult, he became Queen Victoria's personal secretary, an unofficial position that his father Prince Albert had mostly held before his untimely passing. In some ways, Leopold's meticulous mind was ideal for this position, though it also pushed him to be concerned with court interests, something he was much less interested in. Leopold was a smart man. His time at Oxford was some of the best years of his life, where he made lifelong friends. He clinked glasses with celebrities like Oscar Wilde, John Rusking and Lewis Carroll. While these were socially acceptable activities for a royal prince, he was also embroiled in a secret society that his brother introduced him to. The future King of England, Edward, who was notorious for his debauched behaviour and scandals. He was introduced into the notorious secret society, the Freemasons. Leopold was no lonely rank and file either. After all, Albert Edward was a worshipful master and the most senior member of the Oxford location. Following the advice of his doctors, Leopold left his pregnant wife behind to travel to, in February of 1884, in the hope to reduce his haemophilic symptoms. He was staying at the lovely... Villa Nevada residence. He had been there for a month when disaster struck. 
While in his villa on March 27th, he slipped and fell. This should have been a minor ordeal, but due to the prince's blood clotting disease, when he hit his knee and banged his head, it was catastrophic. The prince had been reminded of the dangers of hurting himself and how the tiniest of bruises and bang-ups could lead him severely injured or worse, and for good reason. This fall was devastating to the royal. His condition worsened over the coming hours, until in the early morning of March 28th, the prince never woke up. The culprit behind his untimely end was gruesome. He had done well to avoid this level of injury throughout his life but his luck had finally run out. This small bang to his head had led to a fatal cerebral haemorrhage, which led to his death. In his tragic wake, he left destruction when his mother mourned him deeply. When Victoria heard of Leopold's passing, her response was absolutely heartbreaking. She had already suffered the loss of her dear Albert, as well as Leopold's older sister, Alice, and she was beside herself with grief and loneliness, as she wrote in her journal. To lose another dear child, far from me, and one who was so gifted, and such a help to me, is too dreadful. Then his wife was left alone, still pregnant at home, and full of grief. She gave birth to the son he would never meet in that summer, Charles Edward, who would never know his father. His deadly disease was luckily not passed to his son, but that didn't mean that his family was safe. Leopold truly may have been cursed, and the curse did not end with his death. In the years after his death, his children and his wife suffered heart-wrenching fates. His first daughter Alice passed her haemophilia genes on to her eldest son Rupert, who then went on to die at the young age of 20 in a car accident, an event that his illness surely made worse. Yet Leopold's own son did more damage to his name when he lost his way. Growing up without a father figure is difficult, and little Charles Edward needed some guidance in his life. The man was not plagued by his father's royal disease, but he was played with the extremist ideologies when his son turned into a Nazi sympathiser, fighting on the German side in both World War I and World War II, before the English government stripped him of his titles for his participation. He became estranged in 1954. Charles Edward passed away while living in poverty. Leopold was the first known male royal in the British line to suffer from haemophilia, but he wasn't the last. The tragic tale of his legacy is infamous. One of Victoria's granddaughters was Princess Alex of Hesse, who was also a carrier of haemophilia, and she became Alexandra, the last Tsarina of Russia. Alexandra ended up passing on her haemophilia to her firstborn son, Alexei. Alexei's haemophilia was severe, and his mother grew desperate, even seeking the controversial help of the dark holy man Rasputin to save Queen Victoria's great-grandson. Great grandson. This, as we know now, was one of the matches that lit the Russian Revolution and eventually toppled the Russian royal family. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.